Hi, I'm Dr. Beyond. Welcome for this opportunity to look into the future. Gazing into this crystal ball, we can understand things that we haven't really come to understand in our world yet, a future understanding. And today what I'd like to show you is some information about the nature of our psychic capabilities. Where do we get intuition from? Who are we in this regard? If we look into this magic crystal ball, we can get a glimpse of the future, an insight to the understanding of who we are and how we operate. And today we're gonna to look especially at the psychic nature of humans. I want to welcome you to the inner world of this crystal ball where we can see information that can't be seen anywhere else. And before we go deep into this, I'd like you to do one little exercise. I would like you to close your eyes. And in that moment, I want you to visualize in your mind a pyramid. Can you see this pyramid in your head right now? Where did that image come from? It's inside your head. It's not outside of your body. Where in our brain are we creating images and how are we creating these images? We must go into the story of something called the third eye. It's an eye buried deep within the brain structure and this eye is called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland is reading information but not directly from light. The pineal gland is reading information from the energy field around us. And to understand this, we would go into the anatomy of the nervous system and how this anatomy contributes to the understanding of how intuition and ideas can come into our head in a non-physical realm and yet manifest themselves as a physical expression in our vision and in our consciousness. One of the most interesting aspects about the science of biology is that we've taken living systems and broken them down into individual systems so that every organism has like the equivalent of a digestive system, a respiratory system, or a nervous system. While all these are different functions, there is one common characteristic to a system because all systems have three functional units that are important. And these functional units include input, and that's where information comes into the system, process, where that information is analyzed by the system, and output, where the system creates an appropriate response connected to the input. So there are three divisions of a system, input, process, and output. What's so interesting is that when you look at the nervous system, the elements of the nervous system all reveal a physical structure showing that the subsystems, input, process, and output, are laid out in a pattern of sequentially showing the input followed by the process followed by the output as structural correlations of the functions of the nervous system. For example, let's look at a neuron. At the top of this neuron, you see what are look like antlers. These are the dendrites. This is where information comes in to the neuron. That's called input. And then the dendrites end on the cell body. And the cell body is where the information coming in is processed. And then when a sequence is analyzed, an output is sent through what is called the axon. As you can see, these three subdivisions are physically oriented from input, process, and output. Again, the same pattern is repeated, for example, if we look at the spinal cord. From the top of the spinal cord and we look into it, we see a butterfly shape in the center of the spinal cord. This is where the neurons are. And what's interesting is there's a stratification. The top part of that butterfly is where the sensory neurons are, information coming from the environment. In between is a zone of neurons called the associative neurons. This is where processing occurs. The bottom of that butterfly is the motor output. This is where information is now sent back to the body to control the function. Input, process, and output. Or for example, we could look at the whole brain because we know there are three sections to the brain, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Interesting, of course, is the forebrain is associated with the information coming into the biology. The midbrain is actually that area of the brain that analyzes and creates a response. It's a processing element. The hindbrain is characterized as the motor element because from here, information is sent to the body to control the functions of the systems. Again, there's input, process, and output physically displaced in that exact same sequence. And one final example is if we look at the retina of the eye. There are three layers on that retina. The layer next to the pigment 
is the area that contains what are called the rods and cones. These are the inputs to the vision. This is where signals of light coming in hit the rods and cones. The next layer above the rods and cones is called the bipolar layer. Well, these are neurons that integrate all the inputs coming into all the rods and cones. And the top third layer is actually called the ganglion layer. And this is the actual motor layer that actually sends the final signals that have been processed into the brain. So when we look at the retina, input, rods and cones, process, bipolar layer, and the third layer, the ganglion layer, is the motor output. So what we have, again, is a structural correlation between the input process and output as a physical disposition in all of the structures of the nervous system. Well, this stratification of input process and output really intrigued me one day when I was teaching in an embryology course. We were looking at sections through a developing brain. And in the brain, the central section is called the third ventricle. It's a part of the brain where there's a hollow interior where spinal fluid is running, and then a layer on the outside. But what was unique in this particular section was the symmetry that I saw. It was cut through the brain as illustrated where this arrow is right here. In that section, there was a symmetry that was very profound. It has two walls with a bleb above and a bleb below. And then I looked at it and the first thing I recognized is, oh, in the third ventricle of the brain, the bottom bleb is called the pituitary gland. Well, that's the master gland. In this particular case, that's the master output. That is the motor equivalent. And I said, yeah, but then what is the other structure on the top, right above it, the very top bleb? That's the pineal gland. I say, why is it relevant? Because if the pituitary is the master output, then in the symmetry of input process and output, then the pineal gland would then represent the master input. This provides a new important insight. It says that the pineal gland, which gets its name from a very simple fact, because the structure of the pineal gland resembles a pine cone, and historically has been illustrated as a pine cone. This pineal gland pine cone actually represents a receiver, an input of environmental information. The signal coming from the pineal gland passes through the third ventricle, where it's influenced by the processing information of the thalamus and the hypothalamus that alters that signal. And then the final signal hits the pituitary gland, the master gland, which sends information throughout the body to coordinate its functions. If we go back in history and understanding the nature of the body and its coordination, these controlling centers have been referred to as chakras. There are seven of them. The sixth chakra is called the third eye because that chakra is right above our eyes right here. And I say, but what does it represent? Well, historically, it represents the pineal gland, an eye, a vision. But the pineal gland is buried deep in the skull and doesn't get direct light from the outside. It's an eye, all right. It's analyzing electromagnetic spectrums, electromagnetic fields. So the pineal gland has been recognized to be an input device, a primary input device. Well, one of the interesting characteristics of the pineal gland is that it's filled with crystals. A lot of people consider the crystals to be degenerative processes, influenced by things such as fluoride in the water. Well, let me assure you of a very important fact. The pineal gland had crystals in it long before there was anything called fluoride in the water. Historically, it's always had crystals in it. And it's also very interesting because we're already born with crystals in it. It's not that all of a sudden they showed up. They were there from the very beginning. And so instead of a degenerative process, it is very likely they have a very functional process. Let's go back in time before television and actually the beginning of radio. I say, why is it relevant? Because the first radios didn't have tubes and wiring and all kinds of stuff like that. The first radios were called crystal radio sets. I said, what did they represent? Well, they were glinium crystals. And what would happen is if you would take a pin with a point and touch the crystal at a certain part, you could all of a sudden hear radio broadcasts. And so the crystal was transducing an energy in the field 
into actual radio broadcasts, as you can hear with a pair of earphones. So again, no tubes, no transistors, no resistors, no capacitors, just a crystal downloading a field. And then from that field, there are certain parts where you touch that crystal, and all of a sudden, out of that area, the energy of the radio frequencies is actually turned into sound that you can hear wearing a pair of earphones. Yes, that's a primitive radio. And I said, well, how does it work? Well, just to give you a simple analogy, in the old day, before LCD televisions, we had picture tubes. And I say, what was relevant? Well, in this model of the picture tube, you can see at the back of the picture tube is something called the gun that shoots electrons toward the screen, which is at the other end. And as the electrons hit the screen, they cause it to light up. But between the gun and the screen, there's a bunch of magnets on the neck of that picture tube. And guess what? The information in those magnets alter the beam as it comes out of the gun and before it hits the screen. And it's the information in these magnets that gives shape to the final picture that shows on the screen. Now let's put this analogy into place in regard to the pineal gland. That the crystals in the pineal gland are the equivalent of the gun in the photo tube. That the thalamus and the hypothalamus are generating electromagnetic fields that are influencing the signal coming out of the pineal gland based on our life experiences. And in the end, the information from the pineal gland, as altered by the thalamus and hypothalamus, hits the pituitary gland, which is the equivalent of the screen on the television tube. This is where the image is finally produced. Well, the relevance is the image that's finally produced is controlled by our pituitary gland, where that image first shows up. And the pituitary gland organizes the body to complement that image. Well. When I saw all of this and I started to recognize the polarity of the physical expression of input, process, and output, I was visiting a dear friend of mine, Christopher Hills, a yogic scientist. And I was so excited to explain, oh my God, look at the pattern, because this is how you understand things that happen in science. By understanding a pattern, you can make predictions. So I was talking to Christopher and I was saying, look, here's a prediction. This is how information, intuition, identity comes in to our body through the crystal receiver called the pineal gland and how that's modified by our experiences and then controls the output of the master gland pituitary that shapes our lives. And while I was explaining all that to Christopher, he had a smile which then actually became a laugh. And he said, you know, Bruce, Thousands of years ago, yogic scientists already understood this. They referred to this area of the brain as the cave of Brahma. They said that the ventricle where the spinal fluid was was the equivalent of the primal sea. They talked about the emphasis of the pineal gland sending information into the spinal fluid, sending up waves that now finally connected to the pituitary at the bottom of what is called the cave of Brahma. And that this is how our life is shaped. Of course, I was not only just immediately intrigued, but totally excited to find out that the idea of the pineal gland as a receiver of information that we use in organizing our life is not a new idea. It's been expressed for thousands of years. But the new insight is this, is that this idea conforms to conventional modern biology and the anatomy of the third ventricle of the brain. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. I firmly believe that the third eye chakra consisting of the pineal gland is one of the primary inputs that controls the character of our lives.